Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 24th to the 30th of March. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. So what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? Well, this week we've got some hide and seek and shadow transits from Jupiter's moons. We've got a partial solar eclipse, which is very exciting. And daylight time savings begin on Sunday. There's nothing specifically about Sunday timing wise in this podcast. So don't worry, all our timings will still be in GMT for this episode. From next week, we'll be on BST. That makes it convenient for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's always awkward when that last Sunday and it's like, but this one's in a slightly different time zone. But sounds good we've got a partial eclipse and lots of other things going on so should we start with the planets yes i'll get the planets out of the way first so obviously not as spectacular as the parade that we've been seeing in recent months but we still have uranus visible in taurus it's kind of near the boundary with aries now and it's setting at about 11 15 p.m so you do have a bit of time once it gets dark that is still around mag plus 5.8 so you will need binoculars to spot that I was getting very frustrated last week with so many people saying Uranus you can see with the naked eye and technically it's just on the border of naked eye visibility. I don't personally know anybody that has been able to see it naked eye. So it's a bit misleading. It's one of those ones, yeah, you need perfect vision, an incredibly dark sky sight and an incredibly clear sky and you might be able to see it. Yeah, you need to know where you're looking as well. But that said, we did an outreach event last week and somebody just took a night sky picture with their mobile phone and Uranus was in it. So it is photographable quite easily. So it is worth seeking out. So it does look like a faint star at the moment. A bit brighter, we still have Jupiter in Taurus. That's setting at about quarter to one in the morning now, still at mag minus 2.1. So that is very bright and easy to spot. And on Thursday, the 27th of March at 11.15 p.m., if you watch the Galilean moon, you'll see Io disappear behind Jupiter. And then at 11.35, Europa disappears behind Jupiter. So I think we very often talk about the stuff passing in front of and the shadow transits, but it's kind of cool to see them vanish behind the planet as well so that's a good one it does go both ways <laughs> it does yeah they go around the planet they go behind it as well yeah and you can see it with kind of fairly modest magnification as well so that's really cool on Friday the 28th of March at 9.45pm, the Great Red Spot will rotate into view and at the same time you'll have the shadow of Io visible on the disk and that will be visible on the disk until about midnight so that's another good night to look for Jupiter. On Saturday the 29th of March at 8.40pm, between 8.40pm till 11.15pm, we've got a Europa shadow transit. And while that's going on, Ganymede is going to appear from behind Jupiter. So there, there's lots of kind of to and fro in with the moons this week. So there will be other events as well. If we talked about every event involving Jupiter's moons, the whole podcast would be just that. So <laughs> definitely seek out the viewing guide in the magazine. will show you where the moons are going to be during that month. And Mars is in Gemini this week, so it's visible about 60 degrees above the southern sky after sunset. That is visible until about quarter to four in the morning, so it is visible for most of the night, but it is fading now and it's shrinking quite dramatically now that it's past opposition. So it's only going to be around mag plus 0.4, but it is got that kind of very red colour. It's really obvious to spot, so it's still worth looking for. It's just not as spectacular as it has been. Plus 0.4 is still pretty bright. It's, it is. you know, amongst one of the brightest things in the night sky. It's just not that kind of like, blah, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was really easy to spot when we did our planet observing outreach event. Like everybody in the village was able to see it. So, you know, it is still very easy to spot. 
We've lost Venus from the evening sky. It was actually at inferior conjunction on the 23rd of March. That is when it passes kind of in front of the sun, but not perfectly in line with. That doesn't happen very often, but it means it's not visible, but it's not visible near the sun, but on the same side of the sun as we are, whereas superior conjunction is when it goes around the back. It is technically visible in the pre-dawn sky. It's in Pisces and rising at quarter to five in the morning, about an hour before the sun. Because it's going to be lost in the twilight and very low, it will be difficult to spot. But there is a guide in the March issue of Sky at Night magazine for looking at the slender crescent of Venus in daytime sky. And check that out because it's got all the safety precautions you need to take if you are going to try and do daytime observing of planets that are close to the sun. So, yeah, it's not the blazing thing in the West that we've had in the evening over recent weeks, but it, it will be reappearing in the dawn sky in the next couple of months. We always say when we're talking about things that are happening near the sun, always make sure that the, the sun's out of view. That's a lot easier in the evenings because once the sun's gone down, it's not going to come back up again. But if it's in the morning, Please make sure that you know when the sun is going to rise and that you have alarms and everything and, and give yourself a good buffer. We really don't want you to hurt your eyes if you're going to try and, and look at these sorts of things. And no, no, it's it's just not recoverable if you burn your eyes with looking at the sun through a telescope. So it's really not worth the risk if you don't know what you're doing. Mercury, Saturn and Neptune are all in Pisces, but they're all too close to the sun to observe this week. We do have minor planet Vesta on show at the moment. That is currently in Libra and is heading towards opposition on the 2nd of May. So it's rising at 10.30 in the evening and then is visible all night. So it is a binocular or telescope object at Mag plus 6.1. But during around the middle of this week, it's going to be three degrees above Zubineshamali, the star. So it's a good way of trying to find Vesta. It's a really good star as a marker. And then you can plot the movement of Vesta over the coming weeks as it moves through Libra. Another minor planet worth seeking out is Flora. That was at opposition on the 12th of March and that is still well placed in Leo, again around Mag 10. But this is definitely worth seeking out because in a couple of weeks we are going to have a really special event involving Flora. So it's heading towards the Leo triplet. So get your bearings around the area and keep taking pictures of it and just see the movement of flora because you're really going to want to watch this in a couple of weeks. So make sure you're looking for that now so that you're familiar with the star field. We have mentioned in the, the past couple of weeks, Flora has made an appearance when we were talking with Catherine. So do go back and listen to those episodes if you want to find out where it's been moving across the night sky up until now. Cool. So moving on to the moon this week, the moon is changing from a waning crescent through to a waxing crescent and we have a new moon on Saturday the 29th of March. When we have the new moon that means that we have the partial solar eclipse. So solar eclipses can only happen when there's a new moon and from the UK on the 29th of March between around 10 in the morning and 12.15 p.m. we have a partial eclipse and Eclipses work in a very cyclic nature. So this particular eclipse is part of Saros 149. One Saros is 223 lunar cycles, and it's about 18 years plus a few days. And after one Saros, the geometry of the celestial bodies is in exactly the same place. So basically you get the same eclipse. Not necessarily visible from the same part of the world, but it's the same eclipse. It's about how the moon and Earth are related to each other, but obviously Earth might have turned a little bit more on one Zara cycle than another, so that there will be some differences between the two. Yeah, it's Earth's rotation that means that the eclipse isn't visible in exactly the same spot yeah. on the Earth. But yeah, it's really interesting to me that we've got an eclipse on the 29th of March because there was a partial eclipse on the 29th of March in 1009. And it features in a book, which is an, a really charming book that was published in the 1600s called the Augsburg Book of Miracles, where they looked at lots of completely normal astronomical events and tried to link them to various natural disasters and there's these incredible folios that were painted with these terrifying depictions of these things and they described the sky going dark that day even though the eclipse was about the same amount covering the sun as we're going to get this time which is not a perceptible difference so I, i'm just intrigued by that and they, they obviously link that to an earthquake and loads of people dying across europe which is not linked in any way but i just think it's really awesome that they're on the same date yeah, because it was about that that people were starting to 
link some of these astronomical events happening in the sky with actually like the motions of the planets and stuff. But there was a lot of people who just thought it was, you know, gods getting angry with each other and, and things like that. But because I have actually managed to see a total eclipse and in the run up to it, when it's like if it's a significant partial, you can notice the difference. It's like the color drains out of the world and it does look noticeably. Di it looks like it's overcast even when it's a clear sunny day overhead. It's a really weird kind of half twilight in the middle of the day. Yeah, you can see why people get addicted to eclipse chasing, can't oh, you? Because it really is special. Yeah. So we're not going to get totality for this event. So first contact for the centre of the UK is around 10.07, but the exact time will vary depending where you are. So make sure that you check out your local times for this so you don't miss it. So the moon will begin to make first contact just after 10.07, maximum eclipse is at 11.05, and then the moon completely moves away at 12.03. So it's taking place over a couple of hours. The maximum eclipse is in northwest Scotland, and that will be 47.8% of the sun's disk will be covered. And that's going to be about 57% of the sun's brightness. So whether that'll be perceptible, I really don't know. In the southeast of England, we'll get the minimum amount of eclipse from the UK, and that will be 28%. But if you use eclipse glasses or a safe kind of filter for directly viewing the sun, you will definitely be able to see that. If you don't have eclipse glasses, just take a colander outside and point it at a piece of card, and you will see the eclipse. Every little hole in the colander will act as a pinhole camera and you can project that eclipse down onto a piece of card and see lots and lots of little kind of crescent suns so that's really good fun to do you can use projection with small telescopes but again make sure that the viewfinders and finder scopes are all covered you never ever ever want to look directly so you can do that with binoculars or a telescope but please just if you don't know what you're doing just use a colander or a piece of card with a hole in it and you'll be able to view it that way if you are digging out a pair of old solar eclipse glasses or something like that, do check that you can't see any light through them, even like not a pinprick, because you can damage your eyes. So just double check that those are all in good working order as well. Yeah, and if your telescope is a budget one and has any plastic components inside, don't do the projection method because it will just melt the internal parts of your telescope and you don't want yeah. that either. If you do want to know more about safely imaging the sun, we do have a, a new series of masterclasses coming up. And on the 3rd of April, we've got James Rowley Hill talking about capturing aurora. Very topical at the moment. We've had loads mm. more aurora alerts recently. It's that season. Yes. <laughs> On the 24th of April, we've got Seeing Sunspots on a Budget. That's the one that I'm doing. So we'll talk about equipment that you can use to observe the sun without breaking the bank. And then looking at flares and prominences with Ivana Peranic, that is on the 22nd of May. So there are full details of that on the Sky at Night magazine website, which will take you through all of those components of solar imaging. Yes, and I will put a link down to that where you can buy tickets in the show notes below. So if that's something that's of interest to you, please do join us for those brilliant masterclasses. One thing I will add about the partial eclipse is whilst it's you can see it from the entirety of the UK, we have quite a lot of US listeners. It's not great in the US. It's basically if you are in the east coast of Canada, you stand a very good chance of seeing a, a pretty significant partial, like I think about 90%. So that is, you know, noticeable, even without glasses. But otherwise, you pretty much need to be in the northmost east part of New England, unfortunately. But hopefully, if you are in those parts of the world, do look it up because you might be able to see something brilliant. Yeah, I mean, the, even partial eclipses are always just so special, even though it doesn't go dark and you don't get to see the corona. There's still something just so incredibly special about it. I just love love the fact that we live somewhere where we have that chance ratio where the moon is the same size as the sun in our sky and we can get to see these things. I think it's awesome. It is one of those quirks. It's just by pure chance, the distance to the sun and the, the size to the moon is just happens to line up. And yeah, as you said, it's incredible that we happen to live in the one place that we know of where that happens. Yeah, it's really cool. Now, while we do have a new moon, it's a good chance for having a look at some deep sky stuff. And I think this is kind of our last chance to really explore Orion, because by the time we get to the next new moon, Orion is going to be very low in the sky and we're going to start losing him over the summer months. There is just so much to see in Orion. And at this outreach event that we did last week, I gave somebody a very small pair of binoculars and they saw the nebula for the first time through binoculars. And I just felt that pure joy 
joy that they exuded from seeing that. And you forget that we see Orion Nebula all the time as experienced observers. Sometimes it's great to just get your binoculars out and look at it again and remember that first time that you saw it. And the whole of Orion is just full of clusters. There's nebulosity in it. If you take long exposure photographs, there's tons of different areas of nebulosity. So it's just a great constellation to just explore with binoculars or a telescope. So definitely have a look at that while we still can, because then we're going to lose our chance for a while. The thing I really love about the Orion Nebula particularly is because you can see it just about if you're in a dark sky site and you're really looking hard with the naked eye. At least if you know where you're looking, it is kind of a faint fuzzy blur. But then you look at it through a pair of binoculars and suddenly you see a lot more detail. And then you look at it through a bigger telescope and you can start seeing a whole bunch more detail. And then you take your first picture because for a lot of people, it is their first deep sky picture is the Orion Nebula. And suddenly you start seeing all of these fantastic things and bringing out some of the color. And it's just a really great object as you sort of grow in your journey. As you go through, you can see these things developing. And I, I think that's a great thing to do. Yeah, and drawing it as well. If you have a go at sketching it, you will really study those shapes. And actually, even if you use the same equipment on multiple different nights, the varying amount of the nebula you see will be determined by sky conditions. So it's never quite exactly the same twice. It's just awesome. <laughs> Finally, there are some International Space Station passes in the evening this week between Monday and Saturday. After Saturday, it's kind of lost again for a while. But if you are a space station spotter, there's a good chance to have a look at that this week as well. And again, we have a guide over on our website, skynightmagazine.com, about how you can keep up to date with what's going on with the International Space Station and track it down in the night sky. But thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Mary. As usual, great things. I'm really looking forward to potentially catching a partial eclipse. We'll, of course, be back next week with even more stargazing highlights. So please do subscribe to the podcast. But to go through this week again, we start on Monday, the 24th of March, when the moon is going to be out of the way this week. So take some time to explore Orion before he's gone for the summer. Then on Wednesday, the 26th of March, Vesta will be close to Zubin and Shamali. On the 27th of March, Thursday, from 1.15pm, watch Io and Europa disappear behind Jupiter. On Friday, the 28th of March, at 9.45pm, Jupiter's great red spot rotates into view whilst Io's shadow is also visible. On Saturday, the 29th of March, from 10am, we have a partial solar eclipse. And then in the evening, there's also Europa's shadow transit on Jupiter. And on Sunday, the 30th of March at 1am, it's daylight savings time here in the UK. So remember to put your clocks forward one hour. Finally, there are also some nice international space station passes throughout the week from Monday to Saturday. So keep an eye out for those. Hopefully you get to see some fantastic sights and it will be a nice sunny day when that solar eclipse arises. And we hope to see you all back here next week. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.